this is another video where I'm going to go through a few questions for the SAA C02 exam. So these are Certified Solutions Architects Associate questions related to the SAA C02, that's the new version of the exam. And we just released about 100 or so brand new questions into our pool of several hundred questions. And I'm just going through a few so that you can get an idea of what to expect in the exam. So if you haven't watched the other videos, you can go back and watch those as well. Otherwise, let's get started. So question 13 here, we've got a company allows its developers to attach existing IAM policies to existing IAM roles to enable faster experimentation and agility. However, the security operations team is concerned that the developers could attach the existing administrator policy, which would allow the developers to circumvent any other security policies. So they're worried about a kind of escalation of privileges here. So they want to make sure that the privileges are limited. How should a solutions architect address this issue? So let's just re go over this question because we want to make sure it's all clear. So we have existing. So the company wants to allow developers to attach existing. So they're not creating new existing IAM policies to existing IAM roles. So they want to give them that capability but they don't want them to give them the ability to basically get hold of administrative privileges by attaching an admin policy. So how can we limit that ability? So create an SNS topic to send an alert every time a developer creates a new policy. Well, that's not fantastic, is it? I mean, you don't really want to get an alert every time and have to respond to it. And that's not preventing it happening in the first place. That's just, you know, alerting to something that's happening. We then got use service control policies to disable IAM activity across all accounts in the organizational unit. Well, a service control policy is attached to AWS organizations and you can put your accounts in organizational units. So it's something you can do, but that's going to prevent anyone from doing anything with IAM. So that's not what we want to do. So the next one is prevent developers from attaching any policies and assign all IAM duties to the security operations team. Well, that prevents us from even being able to attach any policies, so the developers won't be able to do anything. So it doesn't really work very well. So the last one is to set an IAM permissions boundary on the developer IAM role that explicitly denies attaching the administrator policy. So a permissions boundary is something that you can use to control the maximum permissions that are going to be allowed. So in this case, you're specifying that the there's a boundary for the IAM role that doesn't allow them to attach the admin policy. So I like that one, and it's the only one that seems to work in my mind. So let's click on check. So that's correct. And we can see an explanation here. It says the permissions boundary for an IAM entity, so a user or a role, sets the maximum permissions the entity can have. So you have resource policies, identity policies, and then you have permissions boundaries. And basically what meets in the middle is, is your effective permissions. So let's click through and go to the next question. A web application is deployed in multiple regions behind an ELB application load balancer. You need deterministic routing to the closest region and automatic failover. Traffic should traverse the AWS global network for consistent performance. So if you saw one of my previous videos, we had a question and the answer was Global Accelerator. And I can see it here now. And straight away, you know, this tells me Global Accelerator because we've got a web application deployed behind an ALB, which is fine. You can do that with, um, with Global Accelerator. And it's deployed in multiple regions and you need deterministic routing to the closest region. Well, that's exactly what Global Accelerator does. You publish multiple static Anycast IP addresses, there's two of them, and then using those Anycast IP addresses, um, they're actually, they get picked up on different endpoints around the world, so edge locations, and then you get routed to the closest region, and it does automatically fail over to other regions as well. And it also uses the global network. It uses the global network, which means you get lower latency and consistent performance. So that's really good. That sounds to me like Global Accelerator. Of course, we're not just going to select that and leave it. We've got to check the other answers as well. 
So place an EC2 proxy in front of the ALB and configure automatic failover. There's not really any benefit that I can see to having an EC2 proxy in front of an ALB and it's not going to help us with this requirement to do deterministic routing or using the global network. So then we have create a route 53 alias record for each ALB and configure a latency based routing policy. Well, route 53 is a DNS service and the latency based routing means that you can have multiple records, one for each ALB, and it's going to, depending on where you are in the world, it's then gonna route you to the closest region. So that sounds like it makes sense. That sounds like something that could work but it's not using the AWS global network. So you're still using the public internet here. The point with Global Accelerator is you're going to the nearest edge location and from there, and there's a lot more edge locations than regions, and from that edge location, you then get routed using the global network, the AWS global network, rather than the internet. So that's still a better answer. Use a CloudFront distribution with multiple custom origins in each region and configure HA. Well, you can have a kind of HA with multiple origins, but that's not going to work in this circumstance by having them in different regions. So I'm still sticking with Global Accelerator. Let's click on check. And sure enough, that works. And again, we've got this diagram you saw before where you've got users and they're resolving those static Anycast IP addresses and then they're connecting to an edge location and then they get routed to the nearest available endpoint. So the nearest instance of your application. So in this case, you know, one is not available, the closest one's not available. So over the global network, the AWS internal private network, you're then getting routed over to this other region. So let's move on to the next question. An application running video editing software is using significant memory on an EC2 instance, how can a user track memory usage on an EC2 instance? So this is a performance monitoring question. So I'm thinking about CloudWatch straight away, um, but I know there's a, you know, this has been coming up in exam questions for a long time now, um, but CloudWatch does not track EC2 memory usage by default. So without even looking at the answers, I know to watch out for anything that says that we should use kind of like a standard metric because there are no standard metrics for EC2 memory usage. So let's look at the answers. Call Amazon CloudWatch to retrieve the memory usage metric data that exists for the EC2 instance. Well, it doesn't exist because like I said, there is no standard metric for memory usage. Assign an IAM role to the instance with an IAM policy granting access to the desired metric. Well, there isn't a metric, it's not a permissions issue here. So we don't need to grant any access, it just doesn't exist. Use an instance type that supports memory usage reporting to a metric by default. Well, it's not a factor of using the right instance type, it's just that CloudWatch doesn't have a standard metric for memory for EC2. So we're coming to the last one again. I don't know why it keeps being answer number four. I think that's just, uh, normally I randomize these um, and I do select different answers anyway in the back end but it just so happens that it's number four again. So install the CloudWatch agent on the EC2 instance to push memory usage to an Amazon CloudWatch custom metric. Now that makes sense. So if you wanna have a memory metric for EC2 instances, you basically just have to capture some data on the EC2 instance and then you can use the AWS CLI for instance to send uh, that data by publishing a metric to CloudWatch. The other way you can do it is use the CloudWatch agent. So you install the CloudWatch agent and then it automatically has um, a bunch of different metrics which are not there by default. So, you know, they're not metrics that you'll normally find in CloudWatch when you connect to your EC2 instance. So I know it does do a memory metric and it is a custom metric. So that sounds like the correct answer. So that looks like it's correct. Let's move on and do one more. A solutions architect is designing a HPC, so a high performance computing application using EC2 Linux instances. All EC2 instances need to communicate to each other with low latency and high throughput network performance. Which EC2 solution best meets these requirements? So it's all about latency and network performance here because these EC2 instances 
are running a high performance computing application and they need that level of performance. So it's about inter instance communications. So let's have a look at these answers. Launch the EC2 instances in a cluster placement group in one availability zone. Well, that makes sense to me. So that's the first answer here, but it makes a lot of sense. So a cluster placement group is a type of placement group which is optimized for inter-instance communications. So the instances get placed close together and they're able to communicate with low latency and high network throughput. So that sounds good. I'm going to select that and then just go and have a look at the others. Launch DC2 instances in a spread placement group in one AZ. Well, spread placement groups are for having different underlying hardware. So it's where you want to spread your application for high availability on distinct underlying hardware. So that's not really the one. Launch the instances in an auto screening group in two regions and place a network load balancer in front. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. That's not going to, you know, in different regions. Well, firstly, you can't use a network load balancer. Um, and have instances in different regions because elastic load balancing is a regional um, construct. So it's within a region. So that doesn't work. Launch the EC2 instances in an auto scaling group spanning multiple availability zones. Well, that's giving you some HA, but that's not what we're looking for here. We're looking for performance. So I still think it came down to these two and it came down to a difference between spread and cluster placement groups. So you have to know your different pl placement groups to be able to answer this question. So I'm going to choose that answer. And sure enough, that's the correct answer. And you can see in the explanation, there's also a partition placement group as well. So there's three different types of placement groups and you need to know all of these for the exam. And you also need to know a little bit about the requirements for high performance computing and for using these types of placement groups stuff like using an elastic fabric adapter and using enhanced networking those are things we cover in our training so i hope you enjoyed that and i'll be doing one more video soon